I've got two o'clock, so I'm going to start. I'm Walter Block. I'm going to be giving a lecture on privatization of everything. I've published about 25 books, and I only have two series. The others are just individual books. My one series is Defending the Undefendable One, Two, and I'm now working on three. And my other series is the Privatization series. And here I also have three books. Uh, the first of these is Privatization of Roads and Highways. Uh, the idea here was that um, highways, streets, roads, avenues should be privatized. And my main impetus for that book was about 35,000 people a year on, uh, die on the roads every year. And that's horrible. We just heard about these kids in Thailand, the uh, soccer kids, and I don't know, 15 kids, and everyone went berserk over these poor kids, which is proper because all human life is precious. But 35,000 people a year? And nobody says squat about it. My second impetus for this was congestion. Uh, you know, we, if you live in a big city, you, you're during rush hour, you're traveling at, oh, two miles an hour, and the fastest way to get around is by bicycle, maybe. The second book in this series is a thing called Water Capitalism, the case for privatizing oceans, rivers, lakes, and aquifers. I wanted to put mud puddles in there, too, but the, <laughs> the, the uh, publisher uh, rebelled against me. It was a rebellion. Uh, here I have a co-author, Peter Lothian Nelson. Uh, the way I got him was, see, I, I don't really know about water all that much, but I never let things like lack of information stop me. <laughs> But I knew I needed somebody who knew something about waves and you know stuff like that and, and pressures of water. I don't know what that is. Uh, all I have is this theory, we've got to privatize it. My motto is, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. And since everything either moves or doesn't move, you privatize everything. But still, I didn't know much about water. So I sent out a, a memo, I think on the Lou Rockwell, um, uh, courtesy of Lou Rockwell, saying, uh, I need a co-author for this. Uh, would somebody write something about some lake in, in Florida? And if I like it, I'll co-author the book with you. And if I don't, you know, you're free to send your article somewhere else. And I got Peter Lothian Nelson, who is a, an engineer of um, uh, oil. But oil has water pressure or oil pressure, so it was the same thing. And uh, the third book is, oh, and, and the reason for this one is um, uh, we're running out of resources, fish resources, and then Captain Kirk, remember one of those Star Trek movies where the guys in the 25th century were kicking the butt of uh, the guys in the 23rd century where our guys were from? Why? Because there were no whales. So that I'm not making this up. It's an actual <laughs> movie. So they had to go back to the 20th century to get whales to bring in the 23rd century so the guys in the 25th century would lighten up. Does this sound science fiction -ish. It's, it's a real movie. But the point is that we're running out of whales. Why? The tragedy of the commons. Uh, so that's one reason. Another reason is I'm from New Orleans, and um, 1,900 people died in the aftermath of Katrina. And the thing that really bugs me as an economist is that the people who were responsible for that, the Army Corps of Engineers, are still in business. Whereas imagine if uh, McDonald's killed 1,900 people. At the very least, there'd be no more McDonald's. Which is why we have pretty good, you know, shirts and shoes and wristwatches and eyeglasses. Because if you don't do a good job, you go broke. But in, in water resources, you don't have that because it's not privatized. The third um, book in this series, I wish I could show it to you. It just came out, and the publisher sent a copy to me in my office in New Orleans, but I don't have it here. Uh, this is um, privatizing the moon and Mars and all the planets and uh, the space race. And my impetus for this is... I'm really pro-human. I hate to admit this, but I'm a humanist. I really like people. And uh, <laughs> some of my best friends are people. <laughs> and my fear is that we're going to blow ourselves up one of these days. You know, poor Donald is trying to make nice with Russia and people are going berserk. Why, we should have a war with Russia? I mean, that, that's not very sensible. So my fear is that we're going to blow ourselves up. And, you know, I have grandchildren. They just were born. They're three years old. And maybe one day they'll live on Mars. And if the Earth blows its Itself up. At least we'll have some people on, on Mars and on the moon, maybe, in 10, 20, 30 years. So uh, that was one of my impetuses, apart from just privatizing everything, uh, for privatizing the space race and also the, um, uh, the planets that we'll find, or the moon. Okay, let me now, uh, with that introduction to the three books, go over each of the three uh, very briefly and uh, see what we get. 
I'll pick oceans first. Oceans are a pain in the neck. The problem with them is that the water goes from the oceans up into the, uh, it gets evaporated into the clouds, and then it rains here, and then you get some sort of river, and, and then it goes back into the ocean. So you get a, a circular flow of water. And, and we do have a theory that you can't privatize stuff that's not scarce. Like uh, my views on intellectual property mean that, you know, uh, once the idea is out there, it's not scarce anymore, so we shouldn't private, privatize it. And yet part of the, the water circular flow is, uh, you know, not scarce. So, you know, how do we do that? I mean, the clouds are not scarce. So that, that's a problem. Uh, another one is um, this Kami Nozick. <laughs> Well, look, you know, I once got in a debate with Milton Friedman. I called him a road commie or a road socialist, <laughs> and he is. I mean, he favored government roads. And, and Nozick, I mean, Milton Friedman is a good guy on many issues, and Robert Nozick is one of our chief libertarian theoreticians. But he has this crappy thing about you pour a can of tomato juice or a can of tomato soup or something into the ocean, and ha, 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 you can't get to own the ocean. Namely, how silly it is to own the ocean. Well, that, that's, you know, that's ocean communism. And, and, <laughs> uh, and, and we're against communism, right? So we're against ocean communism, road communism, uh, water communism. We're against all kinds of communism, unless it's voluntary communism, but that's a different kind of an issue. Okay, why privatize anything? There are two main reasons. One, economics. Uh, it's much more efficient. Uh, the market is more efficient than, than government. And let me get a, um, I think I've got, oh, here it is. Here is a USSR collective farms, and we have, uh, in, in the uh, Soviet Union, uh, there were, what was it, the, the land, uh, the public collective farms were 97% of the land, and 3% were private. And on the public lands, they grew 75% of the crops. And on the private lands, only 3%, they, they grew 25% of the crops. So you can see this vast um, disproportion, which indicates that private is more efficient than public. We've already given one sort of Henry Hazlitt reason why that is, because if you do a bad job, you lose money. You lose money, you go broke, somebody else takes over. So th that's uh, one reason for it. Another reason for it is ethics. If it's private, it's voluntary. If it's government ownership, uh, the government gets involved and the government is predicated on taxes and taxes are involuntary and anything involuntary goes against the non-aggression principle. So from an ethical point of view, uh, we should have the least government uh, possible and you know, ideally no government at all. Okay, so what's going on in oceans? In oceans, the, um, the water uh, acreage of the surface of the earth is about 75% and the land is about 25%, and on the 25% of the land, 99% of the world GDP is created, and on the oceans, which is 75% of the Earth's surface, only 1% of the GDP is created. These are rough estimates. It's really hard to get uh, good, solid uh, statistical evidence on you know, what GDP is produced here and what's there, and this is a little unfair because, you know, there aren't too many people on the oceans, most of us on land. But, you know, all spare and love war and statistics, so... <laughs> and, and, and trying to prove for free enterprise, you know, so, uh, you know, you hit below the belt, it's okay. <laughs> we are now on the hunting and gathering stage with, with regard to the oceans. You remember the old people in the audience remember in the caves, when we were in the caves and in the trees? <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> Not a very good one, but what the heck. Uh, we were hunting and gathering. We weren't farming. Now, we do have a little fish farming, but, you know, uh, one millionth of one percent of the oceans or of the water resources we have is um, fish farming. And all the lefties are against fish farming. You know, the salmon that they produce there are no good or the fish they produce there are no good. Um, we're in the hunting and gathering stages. What we need to do is farm the oceans. And how do you farm the oceans? You privatize it. You own the, the Mediterranean, you own the Pacific, you own the Gulf of Mexico, or your company does, uh, somebody else owns the Mississippi River. 
And now we can get into a little bit better than we were in the caves or trees, namely hunting and gathering. Another issue is a, a real hot issue that really perturbs all my colleagues in the biology department at Loyola and in the environmental, uh, the commie environmental department at Loyola. And what they say is we're losing, what is it, some number of football fields of, of uh, land to the Gulf of Mexico. Namely, the Gulf of Mexico is creeping in and taking over the land. Well, what's the right proportion of land and water? We economists have a theory as to what the right proportion is of, say, parks and farms, or between uh, housing, uh, housing uh, land for housing and land for um, uh, industry. And what's our theory? Well, whatever, the whatever allocation comes about when, uh, in order to maximize profit, right? If we have too many farms and not enough parks, some people will convert farms into parks. If we have too many parks and not enough farms, well, then the, some people in, in parks will go broke if they were private parks, and they would convert it into farms. So we have a reasonable allocation. We have a reasonable allocation between shoes and shirts, right? We, we don't have shortages of one and surpluses of the other. Why not? Because if any incipient tendency to have shortages of surpluses in any one thing, the market will operate so as to obviate it. But we don't have that with land and water. We don't know whether uh, the football field should go this way or that way. Maybe, maybe, we don't, maybe we have too much land, we need more water. I, I don't think that's preposterous, it's uh, conceivable. But in order to find out, we have to privatize the water. Then another impetus is to ward off the UN Law of the Sea Treaty. What the UN Law of the Sea Treaty is, is that everyone owns one over N, or there are seven billion of us, so we all own one seven billionth of every ocean. Can you imagine that sort of a situation? You know, somebody in the middle of uh, Iowa owns a, a part of the ocean, even though he, he's uh, 2,000 miles away from the ocean. We wouldn't have any preposterous uh, uh, organization of that sort in any other field, but we have it here. Then there's a drought, drought all over the place. Um, in Africa, the drought means people die because you're not allowed to ship water from one place to another. Canada, blessed Canada, they're up to their armpits in water and they have rules about exporting water. You can't export water. So you have drought in, in California and uh, water galore in, uh, in Canada and, and the, the price of water in California, since it's so sh in such great shortage, is very high and the price in Canada is very low. So you'd think in any rational arena, they would export water. But no, somehow water is different. You, you can't have uh, commercial activity in water because water is, I don't know, whatever. It shouldn't be commercialized. Then there's the case of the Chinese people that are building reefs in uh, the South China Sea. You know, they take some sandbar that's half submerged and they put a lot of sand in there and then uh, they build it up and they put in some military equipment or whatever. And then, that's okay, that's no problem, I don't mind that. But then what they do is they declare a 12-mile circle around every little atoll and, and reef, and that makes it impossible for anyone else to go anywhere around there. Namely, they're claiming all the water just based on what they did on the land. That is improper. How then should we get to own these things? Well, I go back to John Locke and Murray Rothbard. The way you get to own things uh, according to libertarians, is by homesteading it. So take the Mississippi River. Who should own the Mississippi River? Well, the Mississippi River Corporation, a private corporation. And who owns that corporation? All the people that have been using the Mississippi River. Now, the Mississippi River goes right by New Orleans, so I see these boats. By the way, the boats are a little higher than the land <laughs> because New Orleans is sort of uh, below, below the uh, Mississippi River. So you can see those boats going up there. Well, everyone who's got a boat... Uh, gets one one hundredth or one ten thousandth of uh, the uh, shares of this corporation. Everybody that's got land alongside the Mississippi River on both sides, because we assume that they've been using the water because they're there. Anyone else who can make a case, you know, I swam the Mississippi River or something, I get a share of it. And that's it. So we have a theory as to how you privatize land. And all I'm saying is you should apply it to water. And my thesis here is that water is just fast-moving land. Land is slow-moving water. <laughs> Namely, I'm trying, to, uh, I'm trying to extrapolate from what we do on land, because we do pretty well on land compared to how well we do on water. 
And uh, there is a slow moving um, uh, or non moving water, namely ice, sort of sits there. And then there is moving land. Um, mudslides and volcanoes is moving land. See, what I'm trying to do is uh, look at the similarities between land and water. And uh, the, my critics would say, oh, no, no, they're totally different. Yes, you can have privatization of land, but certainly not of water. And I'm trying to amalgamate them. When uh, cattle were first, uh, we first had a cattle industry, before the advent of barbed wire, how did we figure out who owned which cow? Branding. Then came barbed wire. Well, we now could have branding of um, the whales. All you do is you shoot a little, um, I don't know, electronic device into the whale, and that's your whale. <laughs> now look, there, there might be rustling, whale rustling, but there was cattle rustling. Just because there's rustling doesn't mean you can't have an institution of private property. So at least we could get up to uh, where we were with branding of cows. But then we did much better with cows. We had barbed wire. But we can have barbed wire now. We have electronic um, uh, capabilities of making fences in, in bodies of water. You know, we have too much fish freedom. <laughs> the, the fish are going, it's like anarchy, those fish, you know. <laughs> they have no respect. Uh, we got to, you know, corral them. We got to, you know, make um, barns and corrals. Uh, we got to do on, on the water what we've done on land. Otherwise, we're going to still be on the hunting and gathering stages, which means uh, only so many few people could live uh, compared to if we um, uh, uh, rationalized it and privatized it. Okay, that's sort of a, a glimpse at that book. Uh, non-existent book, but I assure you, no, no, that, that is an existent book. That's right here. Now I'm going to get to the non-existent book, which you'll have to trust me. The publisher said it's published, so we'll talk about that. The space book. What should we do with space? Why should we privatize space? Well, there are two aspects of it. One is the land on the moon and the land on Mars. How should we get? To who should? How should we figure out who should own what swaths of the moon or what swaths of Mars? Well, again, we go back to Lockean and homesteading theory, and we extrapolate from land on on uh, Earth to land up there in the heavens, the heavenly bodies. Murray Rothbard used to say that east of the Mississippi, uh, 160 acres was a reasonable amount for a family of four to have because the, the farmer could homestead that amount and it could keep a family of four alive. West of the Mississippi, uh, the land is less fertile. Uh, so Murray said 1,600 acres would be more reasonable that, that a person could, uh, a family of four could um, uh, what do you call it, homestead, and, and the uh, intensity of the homesteading would be a little different. Because there's a, an issue, well, you know, if you're going to homestead, how intensive does the homesteading have to be? You're going to put a corn plant every inch, every foot, every yard, every acre, every 10 miles squared, whatever. And here you get the continuum problem. So let me just talk a little bit of the, the continuum problem about which there is no answer. I like to approach this in two ways. One is, what is the proper age of consent for sexual, uh, for rape? We know that if you go to bed with a five-year-old girl, you are a statutory rapist, even if she agrees, because we don't think she has any uh, capacity to agree to any such thing. On the other hand, if you go to bed with a 25-year-old woman and she agrees, you're not a statutory rapist. Well, where should the line be? Should it be 14, 15, 16, 17? I don't know. There's no one right answer. You can't say, well, it's 16 years and two months. Well, what about 16 years and three months? What about 16 years and one month? And does it matter if a boy of 16 years and three months goes to bed with a girl of 16 years and two months, or if the girl of 16 years and two months goes to bed with a 50-year-old man? These are continuum problems that there is no one right answer, and you just sort of have to have some sort of consensus or private courts or even government courts, God help us, uh, uh, or legislatures, to make some sort of reasonable distinction. Another one. I'm now going to punch you. Would you be justified in shooting me? No. Because, look, we're having a lecture here. I'm not, I can't reach you. <laughs> it's silly. Uh, on the other hand, I'm going to punch you with this fist, and now there's the, the light glinting off my watch, and it's a dark alley, and you think that maybe it's a knife, and you shoot me? Well, that's self-defense. 
Well, how close and in what context do you have to be in order to uh, uh, have rationality? There is no one right answer. You need some sort of rational man or you know, an average person, or you need a God's eye view to make a determination. It's a gray area. There is no solution. You, you can't say, well, it has to be 14 feet away, and it has to be uh, this much light and, and darkness and whatever, because it's always the context. I mean, in a play, if somebody punches somebody else, the other guy can't really shoot him. It's, it's a play. So I say it's the same thing with uh, land on the moon or Jupiter or Mars or whatever. And as I'm extrapolating from what Murray said about east of the Mississippi and west of the Mississippi, and the more fruitable land is, the more intensive and the longer you have to homestead it in order to become the owner of it, the less uh, fertile it is, the longer you have to homestead it, uh, the less you have to homestead it, sorry, and the less intensive uh, you have to do it. So uh, if you're homesteading land in the middle of Alaska, you don't really have to do it that intensively. And if you're homesteading land in the Sahara Desert, maybe even less intensively. And if you're on the moon, even less intensively. So, uh, you know, the problem is somebody plants a flag, uh, let's say there are no Indians, and the white man comes and plants a flag and says, I own the whole kit and caboodle. Well, that's way over the line. On the other hand, if he starts mixing his labor and he puts in a crop, well, then he owns this area. So how much land uh, should the guy who landed on the moon have? The whole moon? No. Half the moon? No. Uh, one third? No. A couple of hundred square miles? Yes, because it takes a lot of effort to get to the moon, especially with present technology. And I was talking to somebody about Jupiter, and I think uh, that would take even more activity to get to Jupiter, so you get more land, and I think it's even less fertile than Mars or the moon. I'm not sure about Jupiter. But uh, this would be the idea as to how we would decide who gets what part of the moon or what part of the um, uh, Mars. What I'm not saying, I'm not, uh, in this book, I don't, uh, me and my co-author do not say that the reason we should go to the moon and Mars is because of overpopulation. I'm not a Malthusian. I don't think that we have an overpopulation problem. I don't think we ever had an overpopulation problem. And my reasoning here is the existence of slavery. Notice th that we can't be at the, uh, the level of uh, uh, just mere survival. Uh, Malthus was saying when you have more population, uh, you get down to the level of survival. Uh, and when you have less population, we can grow the population, but it has to stay roughly where survival uh, level is. Well, the institution of slavery, and notice I'm now doing a positive analysis of slavery, not a normative. I'm not saying whether slavery is good or not. I'm just saying the existence of slavery shows that we never had this overpopulation problem. Because suppose we did, and people could only produce uh, what would uh, sustain them or a subsistence level. See, that, that's the, um, the uh, what do you call it, the, um, uh, the, the view of um, the overpopulationists, the Malthusians, it's uh, subsistence level. Well, if we were at a subsistence level, would it pay to capture a slave? No. Would it pay to keep a slave? Would it pay to buy a slave? No. Because if we, can only, if we were only at the subsistence level, the slave could only produce enough to keep himself alive. So why would anyone want one? You can't produce any more than keeps them alive. But the fact that we had slavery shows that even slaves who had to have guards and stuff, otherwise they'd run away or, or rebel, uh, even they were way above subsistence level. So this Malthusian overpopulation theory is, is wrong, and I reject that reason for going to the moon or Mars. Okay, so now I've discussed a reason not to worry about that overpopulation. I've discussed how we can get to own the moon and Mars. Now let's talk a little bit about the space race or uh, the effort uh, in, in the direction of uh, that. And here I have to mention this guy named Elon Musk, who has made great contributions because before him, the government, what the government would do is shoot up a rocket and then the rocket would fall and splatter and that would be it. <laughs> Imagine if every time you went to um, uh, shopping or to the movies, uh, the car exploded after you got there <laughs> and, and, and you'd have to get another car. <laughs> That's no way to run a railroad, to mix my metaphors. <laughs> so Elon Musk, bless him, came up with this way of reusing the rocket. The rocket goes up, the rocket comes down with, I don't know, uh, 
uh, some sort of um, mechanism so that it doesn't crash and burn. Some of them do crash and burn, but some of them we can reuse. Well, that's a great, great um, uh, impetus for you know, uh, getting off the planet. On the other hand, uh, he's a bit of a crony capitalist. A bit, that's an understatement, of, <laughs> understatement of, the, of, the, of the world. On the other hand, I'm not necessarily against crony capitalists as a, as a libertarian. I'm not against taking money from the government because the government is an evil institution, it's a thief. Relieving the thief of his ill-gotten gains is a mitzvah, it's, it's good. <laughs> So the question comes, like I had a little debate with Ron Paul over uh, should he accept matching funds? And he refused to accept matching funds. And I think pragmatically that was right. That was correct because if he would have, they would have said, well, you know, you're a hypocrite. You're against government doing this and now you're taking government money. And they, they criticized Ayn Rand for taking um, Social Security. But my favorite character in Atlas Shrugged is Ragnar Danishkold. What did Ragnar do? What did my man Ragnar do? He took money from government against their will. He was a pirate. He took money. That's great. I mean, the less money the government has, uh, the better we are. So I encouraged Ron Paul on deontological grounds, not pragmatic or utilitarian grounds, to take that money. He uh, didn't listen to me. He didn't take it. But on pragmatic grounds, I think was right. Look, we all uh, use uh, fiat currency. We all use public streets. We all go to the library, a public library. We go to the park. We use government all over the place. We're not hypocrites. We are taking away from the government that which it shouldn't have had in the first place. So that's good. So now the question comes, is Elon Musk uh, one of the good guys or one of the bad guys? So what my co-author and I did was we read a whole bunch of his speeches, and guess what? He's not a libertarian. <laughs> so we're a him. However, if there were a libertarian guy doing this, I would say, God bless you. Go take all the government money you can. OK, that's pretty much it for uh, the oceans and the uh, space. Let me now talk about roads, roads, highways, streets, whatever. And you'll remember that um, my main impetus for this was the death, many, many deaths on the highways, and also congestion as a, a minor impetus for writing this book. And um, here's that book that came out, I forget, uh, in about 10, 15 years ago. The uh, uh, oceans was more recent, and the uh, space will, is just coming out. So what's going on with roads? Why do I think we'd have fewer deaths if we had a road privatization? Well, we'd have competition. Right now, the rules of the road come from Washington, DC. And there's one rule of the road for the whole kit and caboodle of the country. And that's it. We don't have any competition between uh, different ways of running it. Now, right now, on, on the, uh, what the, what's highway close to here, the highway 85, uh, you have three lanes. And uh, the minimum is 40. Whoops, let me, let me zoom this way. Here we go. The minimum is 40, and the maximum is 70. And you know if you're doing 70, everybody's going to go whizzing right by you. So, you know, people do 75, 78, stuff like that. And some people do uh, 45. So maybe it's not speed that kills, but rather the variation in speed. I don't know. I'm not a road um, theoretician like Bob Poole, the commie. <laughs> He's a road theoretician. He, uh, he tries to uh, uh, testify at, at the NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. A little applause. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I, don't, um, I don't testify, and I'm not an efficiency expert for the state. I don't try to make their roads run better. I uh, come up with all sorts of reasons, and if they adopt it, that's not my problem. Uh, so I don't feel guilty about saying how, maybe how roads should be done. But maybe instead of minimum of 40 and maximum of 70, everybody should do 55 here, uh, 70 here, and 85 there. Would that be better? I don't know. Nobody knows. The point is that we will never find out. Whereas if you did the road that way and somebody else did the road 50, uh, 70, and 90, and somebody else did 60, 70, and 80, and different people had different rules of the road, and some would work better than others, no? 
I mean, isn't that why we have good shirts and good wristwatches? Because different people are free to do it in different, um, different ways, different styles, different inputs, different outputs, different whatevers. So that's one reason why, uh, just that one example, if we had different speeds maybe on the different lanes, uh, it would be better. I, I, the common sense sort of indicates that if we try different things and some things work better than other things, then the people who uh, isn't working too well, they'll adopt what is working better and we'll reduce deaths that way. I mean, this is serious business. 35,000, 38,000 people a year die and nobody says squat about it. Then another problem is you get some guy over in the left lane who is doing, oh, 65. <laughs> and you've seen that. And now everybody has to go around them. And maybe what is going on here is not so much speed, but lane changing. So on my road, what I would do is I say, anybody doing that, I'm going to kick his butt. <laughs> right? I'm going to be very, very serious. Now, there are songs, you know, stay to the, le the, stay to the right if you're slow, but nobody ignore everyone ignores that. You don't get a ticket for doing 68 in the left-hand lane. Right? Then another one, here's a, a two-lane highway. This sort of really ticks me off. Here's a two-lane highway, and here are two trucks. Truck one and truck two. And you know that this truck is going to come out here and, and try to pass the other truck. And you know it's going to take 15 minutes from the pass the <laughs> truck. You know this. So what you do is you shoot up to 95. <laughs> they call me the road warrior. <laughs> you shoot up to 95 so you can get past this. Well, maybe on my road, what I would say is, you know, this truck over here that's going to keep this faster truck, this is the faster and that's the slower truck, let them go by, for God's sakes. Don't make them uh, creep by you, you know, one inch at a time for every minute, an inch a minute. And the truck is, I don't know, 50 feet long. So it takes 10, 12 minutes to get past. So what I would do on my road is I would say that there's a rule that any truck that, uh, uh, you know, blockades all the cars, for, for more than two minutes, so it's going to get a big ticket. I, I, this is sort of just common sense. I mean, I'm, I never took a course in engineering. I, I don't know anything about roads. I just drive, and I uh, make comments. And, but the key element that I'm, I'm providing is not so much these little tricks as to which way will work. These are just examples. The impetus, uh, what I'm really trying to do here is just apply Henry Hazlitt's economics in one lesson to an area where he didn't apply it, namely competition between roads. He applied it to competition between groceries and competition with this and competition with that. I'm applying it to roads. So I, in, in the book, I've got maybe 15, 20 different kinds of things like this where I think it would be better if uh, some roads tried it and other roads didn't and the ones that learn from the others would, you know, we would do better. Do I think that in a fully privatized uh, road system there'd be no deaths? No, there'd be some deaths. And what I did here in this book is I, here is a single author, so it's just me. What I did is I extrapolated from the other areas where the government and the private are going side by side. For example, garbage collection. It costs uh, the government roughly five times as much as private to remove a ton of garbage. Another one would be post offices, uh, FedEx and Pony Express and all those others, uh, Pony Express a while back. FedEx does much better, uh, again, by a ratio of 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1. Something, there are various statistics where I extrapolate from and say, if we had private and the private were as efficient vis-a-vis uh, -vis government in roads as it is in these other areas, this is how many deaths we'd have. And I came up with 10,000. Namely, we'd, we'd still have 10,000 deaths. Namely, we'd save uh, 30 or 25,000 deaths. So uh, Larry White, my, my critic here, says, well, then the government really isn't responsible for 35,000. It's only responsible for 25,000. Do you get it? Uh, nam namely, I'm saying we'd still have 10. And let's say right now we have 40. So the government is only responsible for 30. My criticism of that is let's stipulate that Hitler killed 6 million Jews. But it took him four years to do it, right? Four or five years. And during that time, through the natural deaths of uh, elderly people, let's say 100,000 people would have died anyway. So is Hitler responsible for 6 million people that he killed or for 5.9 million 
because 100,000 would have died? No, 6 million. He killed 6 million. I don't care that the other ones would have died anyway. If the blood of all of them are on, on his hands, well, then the blood of all 40,000 are on the government's hands, not just uh, a few. By the way, when we libertarians take over and we have a Nuremberg trial, the people responsible for these deaths, we're going to have to deal with them. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me do uh, traffic congestion just a little bit, and then I'll talk about objections, because uh, half the book, three quarters of the book, is uh, filled with objections. We can't do it for this reason, can't do it for that reason, can't do it for the third reason. So what's going on with congestion? With congestion, you have this thing called peak load pricing. Peak load pricing. And here is uh, quantity. This is not a supply and demand curve because quantity is usually on the other axis. And this is time. So this is 6 in the morning. This is noon. This is 6 p.m. This is midnight. So what does the traffic look like? Well, the traffic is uh, very low here. And it, it goes up in the morning rush hour. And then it's sort of flat. In some cities, it's high 24 hours a day, but uh, normal cities, it's not quite that bad. And then at 4.30, it gets really high, and then it, it lowers. So what is peak load pricing? Peak load pricing is you charge more during the peaks. And if you charge more during the peaks, the peaks will flatten out, and this stuff will increase. So instead of having uh, oscillations like this, you'll have oscillations like that. And, and if you do it perfectly, there won't be any oscillations. Probably there'll be some. What does the government do instead of peak load pricing, which would be the... Look, peak load pricing is done uh, uh, in, in Florida. Uh, the, the, the good season in Florida is the winter. And in the summer, they charge a little less because nobody's coming there relatively. And in the winter, a lot of people go to Florida, so they raise the price. I used to teach at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Mass. And the peak season there, when the, when the leaves turn, it's really beautiful. The, the leaves turn pink and orange and yellow and stuff around October, November. So the, the hotel prices are very up through the roof during that time. The same thing with Vail, Colorado. The peak load there is during the winter when people ski. So during the non-ski period, during the summer right now, you can still go there and you can go on those lifts, but it's much cheaper, the hotels. Namely, they're trying to flatten out the oscillations. So in, in all sorts of private areas, you have peak load pricing. Not here. Instead, what do they do here? They have these HOVs, high occupancy vehicle lanes. And I, my, my daughter-in-law has two twin boys of age three. She whizzes along because she's got three people in the car. Those little beasts are counted as people. <laughs> Whereas you get a doctor or a lawyer who's you know, making 500 an hour and uh, he's stuck in the other lane because there's only one person, which is imbecilic. I mean, I love my daughter-in-law, but still, you know, th this is, uh, is non-economic. Or they say carpool. Well, if, if you had peak load pricing, then people would naturally carpool. Because if it costs a lot to go during the morning or the afternoon, then people would naturally gravitate. Namely, the Adam Smith's invisible hand would work. Whereas right now, all the government does is exhort you to you know, be nice and be considerate and carpool. Or well, they have these stupid buses that you know, take a half hour to get to, and then five buses come along, and then you wait an hour for the next one. So uh, the government way of dealing with this problem is, is nonsensical, especially on bridges, what you should do. Now, see here, I don't want you to think that I'm a Bob Pool efficiency expert for the state telling them what to do. I'm just saying in private enterprise, that's what they would do. And if somehow a government uh, person reads this uh, book and, and decides to do that, well, that's not really my fault. OK, let me now talk about a whole bunch of objections. One objection is, here are four roads. And here's your house. And uh, all the roads are private. And you uh, try to get in, uh, in or out of your house. And the, this road owner, road A, says, oh, that'll be a million dollars, please. <laughs> Namely, a blockade. You'll be blockaded in there. That's one objection. If we had private roads, they'd blockade you in. You wouldn't be able to get in or out except for you know, a million dollars every time you travel. 
Right now, if you buy a house, what kind of insurance do you get? Title insurance? You buy title insurance to make sure that the guy who's selling you the house is really the owner of it? And the title insurance company will indemnify you if somehow he's not the owner and some real owner comes up later? Well, under the uh, area of free enterprise, instead of title insurance, you get access insurance. Or, before you bought that house, you would inquire, hey, how much is it going to cost to get out on that road? And if the guy says a million dollars, you're not buying the house. Does the road owner have an incentive to be reasonable? Does the road owner want people to have houses on the side of his road? Well, of course. Nobody on the side of the road, uh, who is he going to charge uh, for anything? He wants to induce you. He's going to compete with other owners to get you to buy a, a, a land so you can have a house there or a factory or whatever, a school, whatever it is. So that would be the solution to that problem. There won't be any um, blockading because the owner of the road has an incentive to woo you into putting your uh, facility on his road so that he can have some traffic, have some customers. Okay, another... Uh, objection. Another objection is that the real reason we have deaths is not because of um, private uh, government roads, it's because of um, speeding and uh, drunken driving. Now, I've already discussed speeding, and I said it might be the variance in speed, not the speed, although I'm not sure about that, but uh, I speculate. Uh, maybe uh, driving under the influence. Um, my uh, Reaction to that objection is as follows. It's the difference between the ultimate cause and the proximate cause. Now look, suppose I take a gun and I shoot right through there and there's a guy walking down the street and I kill him. And now you all grab me and say you're a murderer and I say, ta ta ta, not the murderer, it was the bullet that did it. <laughs> you wonder what kind of drug I'm on. Uh, namely, that's the proximate cause, but I'm the ultimate cause. Yes, the proximate cause is maybe speeding or, or maybe drunken driving or maybe uh, people behind the wheel who shouldn't be behind the wheel, but the ultimate cause is the manager. Look, suppose a restaurant goes broke. We have Mama, what's her name? Uh, Mama Goldberg. Mama Goldberg goes broke. Why do we say Mama Goldberg went broke? Was it because the cook was lousy, the, the place was dirty, the food tasted bad? No, we say it was Mama Goldberg's manager or the owner. She didn't hire a good chef. She didn't give someone a broom and tell them to go and clean the place. So do you see the difference between the ultimate cause and the proximate cause? Yes, the proximate cause might be all these things that everybody says is the cause. The NHTSA lists oh, about 300 um, proximate causes. Uh, there's this guy, uh, Sam Peltzman, a Chicago economist. Boo, boo. <laughs> and, and, and he writes about this, uh, but he's a Chicagoan, so what do you expect? They're all commies over there. <laughs> and, and he lists about 25 different uh, causes of road fatalities. He never mentions the goddamn government. <laughs> Can you imagine a, a, an Austrian or a libertarian economist writing about deaths on the highway and never mention the government? But he, you know, he's uh, talking about the uh, speed, vehicle malfunction, texting, driver error, and they, they list, maybe he lists 25, and then the NHSTA lists about 200. All proximate causes, no ultimate causes. The ultimate cause is the manager, the owner, the government. Okay, one last thing, and that is, um, what's it called? The, the holdout problem. And uh, do we need, um, what do you call it, um, uh, Government take eminent domain. Eminent domain. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so here we are. We're in. Um, we're near Atlanta, and we're thinking of building a road to California. And we want to build the road as the crow flies. Do you know how many people own land between Atlanta and uh, California? I don't know. A couple million. So what we do is we start buying up land here, we buy land there, we buy land here, we buy land there, and all of a sudden we get my favorite character on, on TV. Um, what's my favorite character? Mark Cartman. Cartman. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I'm getting senile, and whenever I can't think of something in my class, um, the student of mine, Anton, helps me, and he's graduating, and I'm, I'm thinking of failing him so he can stay. But... <laughs> <laughs> of 
Cartman. And you know Cartman's motto, screw you guys, screw you guys, screw you guys. <laughs> so Cartman is a holdout. And Cartman says, over my dead body, or for a trillion dollars, yeah, I'll sell you this square mile that I happen to own. So what we do, instead of going as the crow flies, we go this way. Or instead of buying up land, what we do is we buy up options. You know what an option is? An option is you go to this guy over here and you say, look, I'm thinking of building a road there, but I'm not sure. Uh, how much do you want for your uh, square mile? And he says, oh, 10,000 an acre. I say, okay, uh, that's a good deal. I'm, I'll buy it, but I'm not sure I want to buy it. So I'll pay you $10 an acre just for the option to, so I can buy it within two years at my, at my discretion. And then when you get... Um, enough options on any of these roads, then you build that road. Or you announce, here are the, the five ways of building, A, B, C, D, and E. And you say, whichever of you guys get together first, I'll, um, I'll, buy, I'll go that route. And everyone will try to help me because I'll pay more than what the land is worth as a farm. But Cartman owns that plot. <laughs> so what are we going to do? Well, my son and I, we got into a big fight with, what was his name, the public choice guy, not Buchanan, Tulloch. Uh, Tulloch and I got into it on, on, in the literature. And uh, what I said was, if Cartman is that nasty, what we'll do is we'll build a uh, bridge over his land or a tunnel under it. Uh, we don't have this thing called, um, what's it called, uh, ad column. There is this doctrine, ad column, that if you own a square mile on the surface of the earth, you owe down, you own down to the core and up into the heavens, which would make airline travel a bit rough. <laughs> but the point, see, we don't believe in ad column. We libertarians, we believe in homesteading. And and Cartman hasn't done anything um, uh, three miles under or two miles above. So we build a bridge over or a tunnel under. So then the objection to that is that Cartman realizes. Uh, we're going to do this. So what Cartman does is he starts putting sticks down there and sticks up there so we can't build a bridge and we can't build a tunnel. Now we have to talk about football. Now in football, here are the end zones. And you know that if you're over here at point A, you've got a whole bunch of places to, to move. So it's easier to move when you're at point A. Whereas when you're at point B, it's really tough because all you have is a little space to work at, right? and they can have a goal line stand, and you're lucky to make a one yard and four tries, whereas over here you don't make one yard and four tries. Well, the point is, how, uh, how big is our football? We, remember, we want to build a six-lane highway. Each lane is 10 feet wide. That's 60 feet, and then a median of uh, 40 feet. So we, all we need is 100 feet. Cartman has to defend 15 miles. So wherever he puts sticks... He's got, a, he's got a, a defense of 15 miles, and all we need is 150 feet. So what I'm saying is that uh, the eminent domain argument, the criticism that you need eminent domain in order to have private roads, is fallacious. Thanks for your attention.